Good evening. Um, we're in Mark chapter 7. If you want to turn with us here to, to Mark chapter 7. Um, tonight we're looking at uh, verses uh, 14 through 23. Um, over the last, uh, so the last time we were together, we covered a, a very large portion of, of, of Scripture. We covered the first, first, uh, first 13 verses of this passage um, in Mark 7. And uh, tonight, uh, these verses here in verses 14 through 23 actually connect with what we read. This is really uh, one, one section together um, that Jesus is uh, dealing with uh, the Pharisees. Um, and this is kind of a, <clears throat> uh, a, a segment of scripture, if you remember back in chapter 4, where Jesus uh, had this confrontation with the, with the Pharisees, and then he kind of went into this teaching moment um, of teaching the disciples. Um, you know, and this is another moment here where he is having a lesson where he teaches the disciples. Um, so I want to read this passage just uh, tonight and, um, and then kind of give us a, a little preview of what we said the last time we were together and, and get us up to speed to where we are now. So this is what uh, Mark writes to us in verse 14. He says, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? And thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. And from within, out of the heart of a man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, last time uh, we were together, when we were looking at the first part of chapter 7, uh, we seen this kind of conflict session, section of Jesus being, once again, uh, conflicted with the Pharisees and the scribes. We haven't really seen these guys um, since chapter three, I think it was, is when we last seen the Pharisees and the scribes. And they come here and they're confronting Jesus once again about, uh, about his teachings and about what his disciples are doing. And this time they're dealing with the defilement uh, according to their tradition. So the religious leaders come and they've seen the disciples uh, basically eating food without properly washing their hands. This is not, uh, as I talked about, not something that's dealing with hygiene. We're talking about the tradition of the elders, as uh, there's called. And since Jesus is the rabbi or the teacher of these disciples, they address Jesus because what the disciples are doing reflects who he is. And so they're talking about their proper washing. Now, this has nothing to do, as I told you earlier, this has nothing to do with the Old Testament. There's no requirement in the Old Testament law for a person to wash their hands before they eat. Uh, the only requirements, as we saw when we were studying this lesson, uh, the only requirements that was there for the priest to wash before they went in to make the sacrifice in the temple or at a tabernacle. So this is just simply holding to the traditions of the elders and traditions that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees looked at these traditions as being the law of God. They looked at them, as, as we heard, some rabbis even considered them to be uh, come down from Moses, or come down from God, and Moses brought them down from the mountain as well. And so they looked at these rules or these, these laws that they put in place, these traditions, as protecting them from violating the law of God. Um, the reason why Israel went into uh, bondage in the Babylon, uh, under the Babylonians, uh, was due to the fact that they had violated God's law. They, were, they committed adultery, or idolatry. And they were violating the law of God. And so they went into this seven, 70 years of captivity as a result of that. And when they came out, that's where most people believe the Pharisees come from, was from out of the Babylonian exile, because they wanted to preserve the law of God. Remember, they're in a pagan nation being um, in Babylon, which was a pagan nation. But 
So these people, these elders, these, uh, these, these Pharisees, they, they came up with these traditions to protect the people from the law. These traditions become no, uh, later on, about 200 AD, after uh, 200 years after Christ's death or so, uh, it became considered to be the Mishnah, what we know as the Mishnah of the day. They put them all in oral, these oral traditions in writing, and they consider it to be this fence around the Torah. So it's to protect you from getting to violating the law itself. But the problem is, is that these people started holding to these traditions as if they were the law of God and actually succeeding them to be above the law of God. Uh, Jesus wrote this in, in Mark's, or said this in Mark's gospel in Mark 23, 2 and 4, 2 to 3, 4, when he was talking about the, the scribes and Pharisees. He said, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat and so do and observe what, you tell, what they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. And what he's talking about there is that this law that they created, the traditions that they created, put this huge burden on people. Uh, to do these things. There were certain things they, they cannot do. Even though the law didn't permit them not to be able to do it, they had all these rules and all these regulations. It was the, the, the I guess you say, legalism on steroids, I guess you could say, um, because they had all these laws for every single thing that a person could do. And if you violated that law, then you, you were considered unclean. You had to do this to get back in good graces with God. And so they put this, this burden on these people. And Jesus called them hypocrites because he was saying that the burdens in which you were putting on these people, I mean, you're not even doing it yourself, but the idea that you're putting these things on them. Now, if you remember, there was two things that Jesus said last time about these religious leaders and what they were doing. They were saying that first, that their worship is in vain. Um, they praised him with their lips. They, they honored him with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Uh, that's what he said when he was quoting Isaiah. He's called them hypocrites. They, you have no desire uh, for God. Um, this, this laws, these traditions that you're following after, they're, they're, they're making you pursue as if you were glorifying God, but really your hearts are far from God. And you're putting these burdens on people to, to serve God, but they're not serving out of a sincere heart. They're serving, they're serving out of the, the fear of, of the law or fear of the pressure that you're putting on them from social, uh, the social pressures. And that's what we see also in our churches today. We see this legalism that says, hey, if you don't do X, Y, Z in the church, then, you, then you're not a part of God's family. You're not a part of what we do. You're not truly a, a Christian. You're not truly this or that. And, and so it's putting this, this burden on people to serve God, not out of gratitude for what God has done for them, but they're serving them out of the, the respect to, to, to be a part of the church, to be a part of the society of the Christian world or, or the social status of the world, of the Christian world. And secondly, he said that they were voiding out the word of God, that their laws and their traditions were, that they were holding was, as a result, voiding out what the word of God was actually saying in the people's lives. The very thing that it was intending not to do, they didn't want to violate the word of God, was the very thing that they were doing with their traditions and with the things that they were putting in place. And, and we heard that whenever he was talking about Corbin uh, and uh, in uh, the chapters last, or the passage last week um, and talking about how he was violating the word of God. So in the first, ver first 13 verses of this passage of scripture, Jesus is confronting these Pharisees and he's calling them hypocrites because their traditions that they're placing on men it's causing them not to worship God truly, and it's causing them to void out or to take the word of God out of play and to violate the word of God. Now, as we come to this passage tonight, uh, it's directly connected to the passage of the first 13 verses of this. It's a continuation with the idea of defilement. Uh, this passage tonight is actually addressing the questions that the Pharisees asked about the disciples defiling, being defiled by not washing their hands. If you remember, Jesus didn't answer their question in the first 13 verses of this passage of Scripture. Jesus did not address what they were asking. Jesus just simply told them, you're hypocrites and what you're doing is wrong because you're putting these traditions and burdens on these people. Tonight, he's going to deal with, or this passage of Scripture deals with the idea of defilement and what true defilement is. And this is what he's looking at. And this is what we'll understand and why the 
disciples were not following the tradition of the elders. And this is the reason why we also are not looking for the tradition of the elders. So, so the first thing, there's three things about the defilement we want to look at. The first thing is we see the principle of the defilement, the principle of the defilement. Uh, so, so now Mark is, is giving us the setting of this discourse from Jesus. Um, at the beginning of chapter 7, we know that Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes questioning him and asking uh, him about the disciples. And Jesus in verses 6 through 13 is addressing the Pharisees and the scribes. But from this point on, we hear no more about the Pharisees or the religious leaders. There's nothing else that is mentioned about the Pharisees and religious leaders in this particular passage of Scripture that we're looking at tonight. So this conversation that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the religious leaders has now grown to this public setting. So obviously Jesus was in this crowd of people when the Pharisees and Sadducees, our scribes, began to ask him these questions. And now Jesus kind of makes this a public scene, so to speak. Because listen to what it says in verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. <clears throat> so, people, so Jesus calls the people who must have gathered around Jesus in his conversation with the Pharisees who's confronting him. And he commands them to hear what he's about to say. And not only does he command them to hear what he's about to say, but he also commands them to understand this truth. And this is what we must understand, is that God has commanded us to hear and understand the word of God. He has called all men to hear and understand. And if we do not, then we are in disobedience and in violation to the law of God. We must hear and we must understand. That is a, a mandate that is put on all people is to hear and to understand, to, to believe and to trust in Jesus Christ. And then by not doing so, we are being disobedient and thus we are held accountable for our sins and for our violation of the law of God. Now remember in verses, in chapters 3 and 4, when Jesus was teaching and he classified the people as being outsiders and insiders, if you remember that, that passage of Scripture. The outsiders were those who rejected God, um, who were not privy to the revelation of God. But it was the insiders who were given access to the revelation of God that's being revealed through Jesus Christ. And Jesus told his disciples in, in Mark 4, 12, they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. It is those who have turned, those who are forgiven, that are able to perceive and be able to hear and able to understand the word of God that Jesus is teaching. He's commanding them to understand these sayings. And this is more than just hearing the words. To understand is to join together in the mind. Uh, it is accepted as truth. Uh, whenever Matthew um, was talking or was telling us about Jesus' parable of the souls, Matthew uses this word in Matthew 13, 23, where he says, As for what was sown on good soil, that is the one who hears the word and understands it, his deeds bear fruit and yield. It is accepting the word of God. When we hear and we understand it, it's acceptance of the word of God and it produces fruit. It produces something. That is the understanding that we know is when we hear and we understand it and we're following after these things, then that is shown to us or shown to the world by what is being produced by what we hear and understand from the word of God. If we do not hear and understand this, then it will not portray in our life. If we hear and understand it, it will portray in our life. Because that understanding becomes part of how we perceive God and how we live out our life before the world and before God. So this hearing and this understanding is what Jesus is requiring these people to do. Now, what is it that Jesus is wanting them to hear and understand? And that is what he says in verse 15. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person... Or what defile him? Now notice what Jesus is addressing with this logic. He is addressing what the Pharisees were asking back in verse 2 and verse 5. Listen to what they, what they said then. In verse 2 it says, and, and they saw that some of the disciples ate with 
with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed, in verse 5, and the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And this is what Jesus is addressing here with his response in verse 15. The reason that they are not following after the tradition of the elders, the reason why they are not washing their hands to eat and they will not be defiled is because there's nothing on the outside of a person that goes into the person that can defile him. A person is not defiled by what he eats. He's not defiled by some ritual to follow before he eats. That is what Jesus is trying to bring out. That is the principle of defilement. It's not what goes into the person is what Jesus is saying. It's not the food. It's not the ritual before you eat the food that makes you defiled. The statement seems to be somewhat contrary or contradictory by by Jesus and making it seem that he's doing the same thing the Pharisees are doing in, in Leviticus chapter 17, uh, verse 15. Uh, listen to what it says here. Um, it says, And every person who eats what dies of itself and what is torn by beasts, whether he is a native or a sojourner, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening, and then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe, or wash them or bathe, his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Now, what we must understand from this is, first of all, that Jesus is God and has the authority to elevate himself above the law. He is the author of the law. But secondly, we must understand, too, that Jesus is bringing in a new kingdom. And Jesus has come to do, to fulfill the law. He's come to, to usher in this new way of life. He says in Matthew 5 and 17, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law, or the prophet, I have come not to abolish it, but to fulfill them. This is a new age of salvation that Jesus is now ushering into us and now has the law of God that is written on the hearts of men that these external laws is not the working that God desires. It is the working of the Holy Spirit that leads us to righteousness. It's no longer these external things that lead us to these things of defilement or things of righteousness. In other words, what Jesus is trying to say here is, is that it's not the external things that makes a man defiled. That is what the religious leaders and the Pharisees did not understand. Because they did not recognize Jesus as God, they could not recognize that the outside things could not make him or make them righteous, that only Jesus could make them righteous. Only God can make them righteous. So this is the principle of defilement, is that it is not what goes in a person that makes them unclean. But Jesus gives a contrast here and states, but the things that come out of a person are what defiles him. You see, that is, that is the, the issue with legalism, even in our churches today. Legalism is saying that you... There's something on the outside that can defile you, and so I must put these laws or put these rules or put these regulations in front of you to keep you from this outside thing. And all it's doing is putting a burden on the person but not solving the problem. It's putting a law in place that will that will put consequences for what you do, but doesn't solve the problem for why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, it's really, really leading you to, into greater condemnation. And that's why the Bible speaks about legalism. And, that, and when Paul writes to the Galatians and, and those people talking about the greater condemnation of going back under the law of God, uh, under the law, because you have been set free from the condemnation. That's what it tells us in Romans 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And yet he asked the Galatians, why are you going back to those things? Why are you going back to the law that you've been set free from? If you have been saved by grace or saved by the Holy Spirit, are you now walking by the law? Are you now having to be righteous or, or be fulfilled in your life by, by following after the law? That, that's the problem with legalism. It's protecting you from something that can that not that actually defile you, but only puts a burden greater on you. There's a greater problem to defilement than simply what goes into a person. It is what proceeds out of the person. 
from the inside of the person that makes the person unclean. That's what Jesus is trying to say. The principle of the five one is, is not the external, it's the internal. Jesus is flipping the logic on the religious leaders concerning the purity law, the, the purity of the law. And what makes a person clean and unclean? So the principle of the of defilement is not what goes into the person. It is what comes out of the person. Which leads to the second thing here. Second point of the source of the defilement. He has given us the principle of the defilement. It's not what comes out or it is, it is what comes out of a person and not what goes into the person. But now he turns to say to the source of the defilement. Now, I'm just going to mention this because if you're reading the ESV, you would notice that there is no verse 16 in your Bible. Uh, verse 16 records, if anyone has ear to hear, let him hear. Some of the ancient manuscripts just does not have this voice, verse in here. It was possibly added later on. In, in any regard, it does not change the meaning of the text, but just wanted to, to, to mention that. But, but we see this scene once again shifts. So at verses 1 through 13, we're, we're, we're discussing, Jesus is discussing with the Pharisees and the scribes. In verse 14, we see that it shifts to the crowd that has gathered around there. And now in verse 17, we see a shift again. And it says in verse 17, and when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Now it goes to a private setting. We have gone from this kind of, this conversation between the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, it become public with the crowd. Jesus tells them this is the principle of defilement. And now he comes in this private setting to give understanding, to give this revelation. Remember, these insiders, this understanding. And he goes here with the disciples. And he's going to tell them, and it's interesting, that they called the what Jesus told them in verse 15 and calls it a parable. Now, remember back in chapter 3, Three and, uh, or chapter 4, when we started going through the parables, Jesus gave us what was the purpose of the parables because they do not understand. They do not, they, I speak to them in parables, but you will know, and that's what he says in verses in Matthew or in Mark 4, 10 and 11. He says here, and when, when he was alone with them, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables and he said to them, to you have been given the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. But notice this too. Once again, what we're seeing is, is we're seeing a lack of understanding from the disciples. We're seeing a lack of understanding of what Jesus is teaching. And Jesus told them in chapter 4 that they were the insiders who should hear and see these things, but, but they're not understanding. And really, at this point, they're not much different from the outsiders whom Jesus is telling the parables to. And if you remember, this is the portrayal, uh, the, the kind of the portrait that we're seeing of the disciples since whenever Jesus walked on the water to the disciples. And remember it said at the end of, uh, of chapter 6, and it says, and they were utterly astonished uh, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And we're seeing this play out. And we'll continue to see this play out in Mark's gospel, how the disciples are kind of clueless even as being insiders to what Jesus is teaching them, being clueless of this lack of understanding of what Jesus is trying to share because their hearts are hardened. And so Jesus is calling out the disciples here and he explains what he means by this parable. And listen to what he says here. He says, at the beginning of verse 18, he says, and he says to them, do you also or, or, then are you also without understanding? Or are you just like the ones who are on the outsides who have rejected me? Can you not understand what I am teaching you? And he goes on to say here in verse 18 and 19, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and it is expelled? Jesus is now getting to the source human defilement. Jesus gives us the reason why food or the things outside cannot defile a person. Food goes into the body, it goes through the body, and then it comes out of the body. 
and there's nothing in it that does a defilement to the person. If I eat a steak or I eat a carrot, it's not going to make me a defiled person or a sinful person or a person to go out there and commit murder because I ate a steak and not a vegetable. Okay? All the steak's going to do, or all the carrot's going to do, or whatever vegetable I do, it's going to go in my mouth, and then it's going to go through the body, and then it's going to go out. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And what Jesus is doing here, he's given us a great insight into the fallenness of man. He is saying that the reason why the food does not defile the person or what goes into the body does not defile the person is because it does not enter the heart of man. It only enters his stomach. And then it's out of the body. This is something revolutionary here that Jesus has given to to the disciples and giving to the people here. It is not that which is from without that goes into a person that files him, but it's what is already in man that comes out of the person is what is defiling him. The source of man's defilement is the heart of man. It's what Jesus is trying to bring out here. The source of defilement is the human heart. That is what Jesus told the Pharisees when he was quoting Isaiah 20. 9 and 13, back in verse 6, he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. On the outside, they honor me with their lips, but on the inside, their heart it is far from me, and so their worship is vain. The source of man's defilement is not what is from the outside, is not what is external that makes a man defiled. It is from the heart. And this is what the Pharisees did not understand. They felt that, that, that more laws and more rituals would, would cre- uh, that they created will, will cause or keep people from sinning and violating the law of God. The, the law would keep them from, from, from violating, these rules would keep them from violating the law. Uh, these legalistic practices, these legalistic traditions and rituals that we put in our church will keep the people from doing these things. I, re- I remember being... Part of places where it was, you know, it was the tithe and you, you had to do this. So if you didn't do that, you got to make up for this and all this stuff. And they would put these, these, these conscious burden on these people. And I always thought in my heart, friends, if the Holy Spirit can't convict people to, to open up their pocketbooks to give, what in the world do you think you can do that the Holy Spirit cannot do? <laughs> and if the Holy Spirit can't keep a person from, from, from doing this act of sin or doing whatever, then what makes you think you can put something in place that will cause them to do what the Holy Spirit is not able or not causing them to do? And what we have to understand is, is that no matter what laws we put in place, it does not cleanse the heart of man. And we see, I, I am not a lawyer. I'm nowhere close to it. But you can see all the laws that have been put in place in our society. And you know what? These laws, it might keep some people from doing some things, but humanity as a whole, the laws do not keep us from going and acting in sin. It does not. Laws and traditions cannot change man's hearts. To not seek out the wickedness. And that's what Pharisees didn't understand. And people who are living and pushing legalism today does not understand this either. You know, no matter what rules I tell you you should follow in a, in a church setting. It will not make man truly follow God just by following or putting laws in place. See, it must be the regeneration of the heart. It must be the working of the Holy Spirit. You see, no matter what I tell you, you should or shouldn't do, it's not going to change your heart. It's something that only God can do. And this is what the, what, what, What Jesus is saying here is that he's saying that the source of human defilement is not the external, it's the internal. It's what's inside the man. And the reason why food does not 
defile a person is because the food never enters the heart. It goes in the stomach and goes out of the body. It's what's in the heart that defiles a person. That's the source of it. Now, Mark adds this kind of parenthetical statement here. I don't think Matthew adds this, but in the end of verse 19 where he says, thus he declares all food clean, Mark interprets Jesus' statement here that now he's, he's declaring that all food are clean and that uh, that can be can be eaten. Now, if you remember, Mark's gospel is is a, re a recording of what Peter had told him. And if you remember the vision that Peter had in Acts chapter 10, whenever the cloth came down, there was all these kind of animals that they were considered unclean. And, and Jesus told the vision, God told him to eat these things. And, and he said, I will not eat these things that are uncommon. And if you remember Acts 10, 15, it says, what God has made clean does not do not call uncommon. And Paul even wrote on several occasions talking about the dietary restrictions of the Jews have been lifted because God has made these things clean. And Paul just gives us a warning saying, listen, if they feel offended by it, don't eat it in front of them just because you feel like you have the liberty to do so. If you have the liberty and feel your conscience does not convict you of these things, do it because you're free to do those things. But if it's going to offend a brother, then don't do it in front of them. But there was no restrictions as far as eating. And this is what Matt or Mark is interpreting. This passage is adding to the end of verse 19. But the focus is that the source of human defilement is not food, it's the human heart. Which, which leads us to our third and final point, which is the depth of defilement. We see the principle of defilement is it's not what goes into a person, but what comes out of the person. We see the source of defilement is not the food that passes through the body, but it is the human heart. And now Jesus describes to the disciples the true depth of man's defilement. Jesus, Jesus restates what he has stated earlier to the crowd. He says in verse 20, he says to them, what comes out of a person is uh, what comes out of the person is what defiles him. In other words, it's from within that defiles the person. It's not from without. It is what proceeds from the human heart that makes the person unclean. And this is what he and this is what is he goes on to say, comes out of the man. Listen to what he says in verse 21 and 22. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensualities, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Jesus classifies all these things are from within, out of the heart of man. This is the source of these things, and this is the depth of defilement and the wickedness of the human heart is these 13 things that he's listed. And this is not an exhausted list by any stretch of the imagination. Several commentators have classified this list in this manner. Uh, the first one, they listed the evil thoughts as this kind of overarching category for the rest of the list. That the evil thoughts is where these other 12 items proceed from. Yeah, these thoughts sit within the mind and then it, it proceeds out into everyday life. The first six vices that are listed are all plural in the Greek. Um, and scholars deem them to be evil actions. It's the evil actions that are being committed. The next six vices or the last six vices are singular in the Greek and most scholars believe these indicate that these are the evil attitudes or the characteristics or the character traits of the wicked person or the human heart. So he's looking at not only the actions, but also the attitude or the character of, of the person. This is who they are. <laughs> you see a character of the person by, by what proceeds from them. And the character of the person is that they are wicked, they are evil. And Jesus proceeds to say, in verse 23, that all these things come from within and they defile the person. You see, this is the depths of human defilement. This is what makes the man defile before God. This is what proceeds out of a man, out of a person. This is the wickedness that proceeds from their heart. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful, wicked above all things, and desperately sick. 
As a result of the fall, man, humanity, has fallen into a sinful state, a sinful nature. And what we must understand is, is that we hear about free will, we hear about the will of man. And let me tell you, yes, we as people have, have free will. But the problem is, is that our free will in a fallen state is only to sin and we're free to do whatever sin that we desire to do. And we're freely doing these things. And you see our world today, and they're freely doing, they're choosing whatever sin they want to do. They're, they're freely doing these things. The heart is corrupt and desires sin above all things. In Matthew chapter 23, when Jesus gives a warning to the disciples, to the Pharisees, in, in Matthew's gospel, he says this in verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and, hypocr and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup. The play, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, clean the out the inside of the cup. First, clean the inside of the cup, and then the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like the whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men, dead people, bones, and all uncleanness. And so you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. <laughs> All their traditions and made made laws. And it made them no more righteous than any other person. It did not ever change the reality of their hearts were wicked. And the same is true today. The depths of man's problem is our heart is fallen and it's desperately wicked. And what we're seeing in our world today, that we're seeing paraded in our face, we're seeing paraded all around, is we're seeing the result of the human heart. That's what we're seeing. And we're just seeing it in different facets than maybe what we've ever seen before in our lifestyle, in our lifetime. And, and, and we can put laws on it if we want to, but guess what it's going to do? It's not going to change the person from doing it. We're lawless people. We're wicked people. Man left to himself will seek after sin and only sin. And if it's not for the intervening power of the Holy Spirit and God in our lives, then we will only seek after sin. And that's the only thing we're left to is the sinful things of our heart and of our nature. And it's only through the working of God, only through the working of the Holy Spirit, the power of God that can change the person's heart, change the person's life, that can change that inclination of only being desiring of sin. It's something that is so ingrained in us. I said it before. I think it was, I think it was John MacArthur that made the statement that friends, sin is so ingrained in us that we can't even breed it out of us. Our children are born in sin. That's how ingrained it is in our nature. The source of it is the, that of the human heart. We desire sin above all things. And then no external law can change that. And this is the reason God gave the promise that he gave in Jeremiah of a new covenant that will conquer a man's problem. In Jeremiah 31, 33, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Uh, after those days, declare the Lord, I will put my law within them, that, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The law is, the law is not going to be external because external is not the problem. The law is going to come internally and solve the problem eternal, internally because that's where the problem is. The, God gave a promise to Ezekiel that he will solve the heart problem of humanity. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, he says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful uh, be careful to obey my rules. 
These are, these are not laws that God's put in place. This is a supernatural power of God changing the inner person of man that God's going to come in through the Holy Spirit and change the person's heart. And then he's going to write that, the laws of God on that new heart of flesh and take away that heart of stone that's inclination is only to sin. And he's going to give us the desire to want to serve him, a desire to want to seek him, a desire to want to know his word. And that's what Jesus did when he came and died on the cross for our sins. In Isaiah 53 and 11, it says, And out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, talking about Jesus, will make many to account, be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The passage that we read uh, before we uh, started uh, tonight um, in, uh, in Titus, uh, Titus writes this, in, in, or Paul writes this to Titus in, in chapter 2, verse 11. He says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to, to live self controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope. Uh, the appearing of the glory of our great God, the Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from what? From all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. What does that say? It's saying it's an act of God. <laughs> That we desire good works. It's an act of God that he's creating within us, this supernatural, this new creation within us that only God can do to revert the, the wickedness of human heart that has fallen because of Adam. He made us righteous through his death. And he sent the Holy Spirit to give us a new heart, the regeneration, that we can have the righteousness of Christ and no longer be considered defiled before God. That then what proceeds from man, what proceeds from a person who's been regenerated is those good works, which Paul says in, in, in Ephesians that were ordained for us before the beginning of time. But it's only after Paul writes, if you remember that passage of scripture in chapter two of Ephesians, and I don't mean to go here, but I guess we might as well since, we're, since it's on our mind. You know, uh, I think uh, Frankie read this this morning uh, to us or someone did in our Bible study. But, but it, you know, it says at the beginning there that we were dead in our trespasses and sins uh, of chapter 2, in which we were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is who we are. This is the defilement of man. This is the internal being of man. This is what's proceeding from man. Verse 4, but God. It's not but man. It's not but the laws that man put in place. It's not but the traditions that man has, has established. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us. Even when we were dead in trespass and sin. Made us. He made us. Alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up and raised us up with him and seated us in the, with him in heavenly places in, in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. <laughs> not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a resort of works. Not a result of the legalism that's been in place. Not a result of the traditions that you have put in place. Not a result of the bylaws and constitutions you have put in place that has made man righteous before God. So that, one, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Why? Because we've been saved by grace. Because God has made us alive in him in Christ Jesus. Because God has done this. So now that God has done this, now we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared before him that we should walk in them. It's only after God transforms our heart, he takes away that stony heart, and gives us a new heart, that we can walk in the good works in which he has prepared for us. And you see, that's an internal thing. External laws cannot change that. 
only God can. And that is what Jesus is, or Mark is saying here that Jesus is proclaiming to his disciples. Is that, friends, the defilement of man is not the external. Is what proceeds from the heart of man that is what defiles it. And there's no laws or no things that we can put in place man-made that can change the defilement of man. It might restrict it to some degree, but it cannot get to the root of the problem. Only God can do that. Only God can change the heart of man. And make it desire the good works of God over the sinfulness of his nature. And that's what we must understand about the Bible. It's not the rules and regulations. It's the working of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of his word. That changes the heart of man. To not be defiled, but to be righteous before God. Because of the work that Jesus Christ did for us. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you, God, for the love that you have shown us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to take those sins, God, that we may take on the righteousness of Christ. And that, Father, we could overcome only through the power of the Holy Spirit the defilement and wickedness of our own hearts that lead us to destruction. God, our hearts are desperately wicked, desperately sick, and God, without a supernatural touch from you, God, we remain in that state. And God, I'm just so grateful and so humble, God, that you have touched my life and you've touched the lives of your people that you've called, that changed our life, that changed our hearts, to call upon you. And God, to receive the grace and the mercy and that new heart, new spirit, the law written upon their hearts. God, that we may serve you and walk in the good works in which you have ordained for us before the beginning of time. God, what joy it should bring to our hearts. And God, what passion and fervor it should put upon us to want to go and proclaim the gospel message that regenerates the hearts of wives, of men, that are living out the defilement of their lives, Lord. God, we should look at this world, and yes, we should be angry with sin, but God, we should look at this world and be heartbroken because they're following after their hearts and God is leading them to destruction. And the only thing that can change that is the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, help our churches, help our, our men of God who stand in pulpits and lead our churches to see the necessity, God, that the word of God is the only thing that can truly change the heart of man, that you work through the, your word. That's what you ordained. God, let us be faithful to that. God, we just thank you and love you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen.